What if there was a zone, or region, in which unexplained phenomenon and mysterious incidents were the norm? What if in this zone of mystery, space and time didn't always behave in a predictable fashion? There is a location in the heart of North America, that has been referred to by many as the Great Lakes Triangle. This region encompasses Michigan, and portions of Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Ontario, Canada. This area has become infamous for the number of vanishings, fateful disasters, and unusual phenomenon within its borders. Unusual clouds, fogs, and mists, have been known to descend upon unsuspecting ships and planes. The mystery only deepens when the fog lifts, or the clouds part to reveal the ship, or plane, has disappeared in an instant. Not only have ships and planes met their untimely fates on these shores, but occasionally, people also seem to vanish into thin air, sometimes returning, and other times not. Within the boundaries of the Great Lakes Triangle are several other zones of mystery, where a variety of unexplained phenomena are even more concentrated. The Lake Michigan Triangle occupies southern Lake Michigan, while the Marysboro Vortex resides within the eastern shore of Lake Ontario. Statistically, unusual experiences take place more than average in the Great Lakes Triangle, but within the Lake Michigan Triangle, and the Marysboro Vortex, the unusual and unexplained seem to be even more concentrated, and focused. Unexplained vanishings and untimely fates of planes and vessels, aren't the only mysterious phenomenon lurking around the shorelines of the Great Lakes. These ancient lakes have also been a hot spot for UFOs and USOs, underwater submersible objects, for decades. In the 1950s, a military jet and crew vanished while chasing down a UFO over Lake Superior. In the 1960s, Ann Arbor, Michigan, witnessed a week-long UFO flap. The sightings created such a commotion that J. Allen Hynek, from the government's Project Blue Book, was forced to come to investigate. The project's final conclusion was the unexplained phenomenon was most likely, swamp gas. In the 1990s another mass sighting took place in southwest Michigan. Hundreds of people including police and weather radar operators, witnessed several unexplainable luminous objects in the night sky. This happened to occur on the eastern shores of the so-called, Lake Michigan Triangle. Modern sightings of UFOs, or UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon, as they are being dubbed in modern times, still grace the lakes frequently. In 2006 a UFO made an appearance above the crowded O'Hare Airport, in Chicago. After hovering above a terminal for several minutes it shot straight up, leaving a hole punched cloud, and witnesses in awe. Considering the unusual vanishings and the mysterious phenomenon permeating this region, some have speculated. Could there be a vortex, or even portals, at play in some aspect? Coincidentally, or not, in many of the same areas of the unexplainable phenomenons are ancient landscapes, that have been considered sacred for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. There are several stone circles and many mounds that the ancient cultures considered sacred, and possibly even portals, in these precise zones. Is it possible ancient cultures recognize these energy zones, or possible portal points, and mark them with stone circles and stellar markers? Could these regions that may have once rippled space and time, still be active today? An important point of interest is the fact that many of the ancient sacred sites, and zones of mystery, contain magnetic and gravitational anomalies. It may come as a surprise to discover that both the US, and Canada, began conducting surveys in the 1950s, searching out these magnetic anomalies. Both countries' projects were dubbed, Project Magnet. What did these governments discover after decades of research, studying these anomalous magnetic zones? First, a brief dive into a few of the unusual, and many times unexplainable happenings within the boundaries of these, time-rippling lakes. The Disappearance and Reappearance of Stephen Kubaki one of the stranger missing person cases that has bubbled to the surface in the Lake Michigan region, is that of Stephen Kubaki. Stephen was attending Hope College in Holland, Michigan, during February of 1978, when he made a fateful decision, to make a solo cross-country ski trip onto the icy shores of Lake Michigan. The young adventurer, failed to return home the following day, causing an urgent search by local authorities and the Coast Guard. During an exhaustive search, a few items were finally retrieved. A couple hundred yards out on the ice of Lake Michigan, items belonging to Stephen were discovered in a peculiar fashion. Sitting in the snow were his skis, poles and backpack. According to searchers, it appeared as if the young man had stepped out of his skis, set down his poles, and had ventured out further onto the lake. The scenario started to become even more unusual, when it was realized the tracks abruptly ended after a couple hundred feet. It was, as if Stephen had vanished. Following days of searching, it was concluded that the adventurous student, must have met his untimely fate, in a fall through the ice. 
The story takes a strange turn when 14 and a half months later, Stephen awakes in a field, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 700 miles from the shores of Lake Michigan. Stephen now found himself, just 40 miles from his father's home. Imagine the joy and amazement, when Stephen knocked on the family door once again. Stephen claims, to have absolutely no memory of the missing 14 months of time. Upon return, Stephen said, the only thing I can think of, is what mountain climbers suffer from, loss of body heat and exhaustion. That combination can result in a temporary loss of memory. I have some really vague feelings, I have some running shoes. I feel like I've done a lot of running. I also have a marathon t-shirt from Wisconsin. I don't know how I got it. Stephen promised he would visit his family doctor, but would not be seeing a psychiatrist. To this day, Stephen does not discuss the incident. He either doesn't truly recall, or possibly just prefers to keep such an unusual, and personal experience private. Although he would not see a psychiatrist following the reappearance, he became one as a career. Today he is both a psychiatrist and author. His latest book is entitled, Rethinking God and Existence. Traverse City Cherry Festival and the Missing Albatross Every 4th of July, Northern Michigan's Traverse City holds its annual Cherry Festival. The festival draws large crowds, from all over the state. One of the main festival events is the Giant Air Show, that brings in the likes of the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. The 1998 show was unlike others, considering it was in part turned into a rescue mission. On July 3rd, Don Schaller of Quincy, Illinois, would be piloting a two-seat Aero L-39 Albatross, on a practice flight in preparation for the air show. Today was a special day for Don, not only would this be his first time performing at the Cherry Festival, but it was also his 29th wedding anniversary. Don arrived at Cherry Capital Airport, gassed up, and prepared for his test flight. Along for the ride, would be Don Rodriguez, a flight instructor at Northwestern Michigan College. Departing from Cherry Capital Airport, Schaller guided the plane north, past the Manitou Islands and towards Beaver Island. Soon he had the craft about 27 miles out, and was heading back. At this point, the radar showed the jet in the vicinity, of South Fox Island, and heading toward Cherry Capital Airport. The last radio transmission came, at about 6 p.m. Flight controllers, expected to hear from Schaller again, when he was about 5 miles out. Unfortunately, that transmission never occurred, the plane vanished from radar. Search and rescue resources, were immediately deployed. Coast Guard helicopters, were dispatched from Traverse City, to begin a search. For the next few days, the copter crews equipped with night vision goggles, scanned the waters of Lake Michigan. They were accompanied by a Canadian, C-130 cargo plane, and the Blue Angels, C-130, dubbed Fat Albert. A Coast Guard utility boat, along with the planes, repeatedly searched the area between North Manitou, and South Fox Islands. But no sign of the albatross was found. No oil slick, no debris nothing. That evening, Christine Schaller got the call, her husband's plane had disappeared. I got a phone call from Don's partner, Schaller's wife, Christine said. I thought. Is this real? He said the plane had gone out, and it had not come back, they were searching and he'd get back with me. Then things run through your mind. Did I tell him I loved him this morning when he left? She did. She recalls, giving him a kiss goodbye, and telling him to fly pretty. Although the fate of the two pilots, and their plane is still up in the air, Christine has revealed that the Michigan State Police, think the plane went down, in what is called, the Great Lakes Triangle. The Ken Ross Incident and the Visitors One bizarre and as of yet unexplained incident, occurred on November 23, 1953, over Lake Superior, near the Sioux Locks. That night, Air Defense Command radar tracked an unidentified target, moving at 500 miles per hour over the lake. A F-89 Sea Scorpion jet interceptor, from Michigan's Kinross Air Force Base took off in hot pursuit. The interceptor was piloted by 26-year-old First Lieutenant, Felix Eugene Munkla Jr. Lieutenant Munkla's radar operator was Second Lieutenant, Robert L. Wilson. Radar operators observed their radars, as the jet closed in on the unidentified object. Then the radar blips merged, conveying the objects must be in the same region of airspace. Through slight static, Lt. Munkler relayed, I have an eyeball on the target, I am going in for a closer look. With each transmission, the static grew, and each message became increasingly unintelligible. This would be the last transmission from the Scorpion. The radar blip of the unidentified object continued north, momentarily before disappearing off radar. The Scorpion and crew seemingly vanished, 
The U.S. Air Force immediately initiated a search and rescue operation. The pilot of another Scorpion joined the search. He said that he heard a brief, and garbled, radio transmission, from 1st Lieutenant Munkla, about 40 minutes after the plane had disappeared from radar. No one else heard the radio call, and it could not be confirmed, but seemed strange nonetheless. For weeks, boats and planes unsuccessfully combed the water searching for any clues. They never turned up a piece of wreckage, or put eyes on any oil slicks. To this day the Canross incident is still a baffling mystery, it was as if, the plane and crew vanished into thin air, or was transported into another realm. November 11, 1953 was a fateful day for the U.S. Air Force. Not only had they lost two airmen, and a jet over Lake Superior, but also another jet and its crew, on the opposite side of Lake Michigan. Only a short six hours before the Ken Ross incident occurred, two Truax field officers, 1st Lieutenant John W. Schmidt, and radar operator Captain Glenn E. Collins, would meet their fates in an unusual crash. While on a routine test flight, their engines inexplicably quit. Without any radio communication, or distress call, the F-89C Scorpion jet crashed and exploded, in the swampy arboretum shoreline of Lake Wingra, near Madison, Wisconsin. The loss of transmission capabilities, sounds very similar to the Ken Ross case and others. Another thought to ponder, considering the context of the unidentified object over Lake Superior. In ufology circles it is well established that ships, cars, and planes many times suffer electronic malfunctions, including complete power loss in some instances. Is it possible these two incidents were connected? Synchronicities many times linger around these unusual cases. In this instance, it was almost beyond coincidental that the two pilots, of the separate planes and accidents, happened to be friends. Not only were they and their spouses friends, but also neighbors in Wisconsin. They happened to live only a few hundred yards away from each other. The Ken Ross incident wouldn't be the first or last game of cat and mouse the U.S. and Canadian Air Forces would engage in with unidentified objects over these waters. In 1975, and in a relatively near location to the Ken Ross incident, another jet interceptor would be forced to chase down a UFO. On November 11th, citizens, police, and military officials near the town of Sudsbury, Ontario, would all witness extremely bright lights maneuvering in unimaginable ways. The lights were so unusual, that again Air Force jets were scrambled to intercept. As the jet closed in on the unidentified object, it shot directly up into space and off of radar in an instant. This region where northern Michigan and southern Canada collide, seems to be somewhat of a portal point, or window area in which strange phenomenon easily manifests. Planes vanish, people go missing, UFOs frequent the skies and synchronicities fill the air. In regards to the Sudsbury UFO, and synchronicities. On the same day only a few hours earlier, and a couple hundred miles away, the mighty Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. The enormous ship sank so quick, that once again the captain was unable to send off a distress call. Sound familiar? One last unrelated, yet interesting synchronicity, is that on the same day, November 11, 1975, famous UFO abductee Travis Walton, was being returned from his perceived abduction in Arizona. Small world. Lake Erie, and the search for the Admiral and Clevco. On December 2, 1942, the Admiral and Clevco, departed Toledo, Ohio. The Admiral, was a large tug being used to tow the tanker barge named, Clevco. While traveling the southern shores of Lake Erie, the Clevco witnessed something unexpected, the crew of the Clevco was mesmerized when the tug pulling them, disappeared into a snow squall. The men initially were puzzled, yet not alarmed, because the line connecting the two vessels remained tight. Shortly thereafter alarm ensued, when the crew of the Clevco realized the tow line that should be pointing in front of them, now seemed to be pulling tight, in the direction of the bottom of the lake. It became clear to the men, that the Admiral, had sank in an instant. No distress call, or blow of the horn. Just gone. The Admiral at the bottom of the lake, was acting like an anchor for the Clevco, as they awaited rescue. The captain gave his coordinates to the Coast Guard, and other rescue operations, and waited for their arrival. Two Coast Guard cutters were deployed, the Ossipi and Crocus, both kept constant contact and communication with the Clevco, as they closed in. Civil Air Patrol, initially spotted the Clevco, and realized she was now adrift from her original location. It was unclear if the captain, had cut the barge loose, or she broke free on her own. The rescue pilot, would have directed surface rescue to the distressed vessel, if it wasn't for another unusual event. A large cloud of snow descended upon the Clevco, causing a loss of visual confirmation. Almost at the same time, the pilot realized their radio had completely failed, forcing a decision to return to base. 
The Coast Guard ship, Ossipi, got within 150 yards of the Clevco. It wasn't long before a cloud of snow, once again descended upon the barge, causing her to be lost again. During this game of cat and mouse, radio communications were taking place between the vessels, until 4.40 p.m., at which they were completely lost, for good. The Ossipi, encountered a few of its own strange events during the 12-hour search, in particular, the gyro spinning out of control until it broke. The other ship, the Crocus, at one point burst into flames, and was forced to return to base. The two disappearing and reappearing vessels, were only to be discovered on the bottom of the lake, decades later. Both ships, were surprisingly intact, leaving investigators somewhat puzzled. Their final conclusion was that considering how intact the ships were, they must have iced over as they entered the clouds of snow, lost their ability to float, and sank in an instant. As strange as this case is, it contains many similar clues to previous happenings. Commonalities, such as disappearing in instant, equipment malfunctioning, lack of distress calls, and of course, the strange clouds. In many instances, these strange clouds and in some cases fog banks, seemingly descend upon ships, or envelop planes. When the unusual weather lifts, they have vanished. Mammoth stone circles, and underwater anomalies. Scattered across the surface of the region, and on occasion underwater, are ancient monuments considered sacred to the native cultures of these areas. The Great Lakes region was at one time dotted with ancient mound sites, covered in petroglyphs, and home to many stellar stone circles. Several of the stone circles remain to this day, and are considered both sacred, and power spots, by many. Hidden beneath the waters of Grand Traverse Bay, lies an ancient stone circle, that hasn't been visible to humans for possibly 10,000 years. That is until 2007, when underwater archaeologist Mark Holly made a discovery of a lifetime. While doing sonar scans for shipwrecks, something unexpected began to show up on radar. Beneath approximately 40 feet of water, appeared to be a ring-like feature of stones. Extending from the large ring of stones, was a very straight line of large boulders, leading away from the circle for around one mile. The circle consisted of extremely large boulders, some as large as four to five feet. One boulder in particular appeared to have an incredible carving of a mastodon on it. Considering both the carving, and the fact this site is now underwater, archaeologists now feel this site may be over 10,000 years old. Archaeologists have also speculated, could this have been a caribou drive lane, and the circle a hunting fort of sorts? While this is surely an option, there may be other possibilities. Ancient cultures around the world would build stone circles, not only to track the stars, but to connect with the cosmic energies, that they felt permeated that sacred landscape. Coincidentally, or not, many times the ancient stone circles, would have lines of stones following energy lines, or ley lines, away from the main circle. This scenario seems very familiar when looking at the mammoth circle. Could this ancient circle have been a marker of sorts, for cosmic energies? A portal, or a place, to try to connect, with other realms? Less than a hundred miles, almost directly north, sits another ancient circle, the Great Stone Circle of Beaver Island. An interesting fact, is that there has been an unusual number of unexplained plane, and ship incidents, in this area. Recall the Albatross jet, that went missing on a test run, before the Traverse City Cherry Festival. The plane went missing, somewhere in the vicinity of these two megalithic stone circles. To say there is any correlation, is true speculation, yet worthy, of further investigation. An underwater anomaly, lies hundreds of feet beneath Lake Superior, that is as of yet undiscovered, at least officially. As of now, archaeologists have not recognized this feature. Considering its mysterious origin, here are a few speculations, and possibilities. A cometary impact. Volcanism. Ancient Mega Mound Site. Atlantean Mining Operation. And lastly, an underwater government, or UFO base. For more information on this amazing structure, please refer to the previous video. Disclosed. The Lake Superior Anomaly. One correlation, that many of these ancient, and sacred sites have in common, is that of unusual experiences. Phenomenon in these areas include, disappearances, missing time, UFOs, unexpected failure of electronics, and extremely unusual weather, just to name a few. Of course, just because they're unusual, does not mean they are necessarily unnatural. Could there be any studies, that could help to shed some light, on these mysteries bubbling up from the ancient waters known as the Great Lakes, and the sacred landscapes dotting the shores? In 1998, there was a landmark study done in regards to Native American sacred landscapes, the report was researched, and edited by Vine Deloria, from the University of Colorado, and Richard W. Stoffel, from the University of Arizona. 
The report was sponsored by the Legacy Resource Management Program and the United States Department of Defense. Some of the study's conclusions are very interesting and perhaps relevant in the context of the ancient landscapes and strange phenomena surrounding them. On page 36 of the report, it points out several tribes have traditions which recount their passage from another star system to this one and their emergence on our planet at a particular location. These sites may be understood as portals where it is possible to pass from one universe to another. With the advent of chaos theory and the elaboration of knowledge of the potential of black holes in the space-time fabric of the universe, these traditions now take on added significance. Another commonality between the Great Lakes sacred sites and the unusual occurrences that take place around them may have to do with magnetism. There seems to be a big enough connection to persuade several governments to launch heavily funded studies. In the early 50s, Canadian engineer and UFO researcher Wilbert Smith proposed to the Canadian Department of Transport a study of the unknown objects using their pre-existing equipment. A partnership was formed. The cover for the study was there would be geomagnetic experiments taking place. This study took on the name Project Magnet. In 1953, Project Magnet moved into a borrowed Department of Transport building at Shirley's Bay on the Ottawa River. Research equipment included a magnetometer, a gamma ray detector, a powerful radio receiver, and a gravimeter to measure gravity fields in the atmosphere. Wilbert Smith believed the unexplained phenomenon taking place over the lakes surely had something to do with magnetics. The Canadian Project Magnet only lasted a few years, with the information collected being classified. Smith later revealed he truly felt there were objects and likely occupants from outside our time and space that were using magnetic forces as a way of propulsion. One can speculate. Could the magnetic forces also play a role in opening portals or even causing rifts in space and time? The same time, Canada's Project Magnet was ending, America's was just getting started. The US's Project Magnet took place from 1951 to 1994. The project's official purpose was a major geomagnetic survey supporting world magnetic modeling and charting. Unlike Canada, the Navy denied any investigation via this project in regard to UFOs. They were however, able to map out many of the magnetic anomalies around the Great Lakes, and for that matter, the world. Could these magnetic anomalies have any significance in relation to this investigation? For years, researchers have known that the Earth and Sun must be connected. Recently, in an unusual and unexpected way, this cosmic connection was confirmed. Scientists realize that a portal opens up connecting our sun to the earth. Researchers have discovered that a magnetic portal opens linking the sun to the earth, 93 million miles away. It's called a flux transfer event, or FTE. The portal takes the form of a magnetic cylinder, about as wide as earth. Is it possible that this magnetic portal cylinder concentrates its cosmic energies at particular locations on the planet? According to NASA's Dr. Tony Phillips, a favorite theme of science fiction is the portal an extraordinary opening in space or time that connects travelers to distant realms. A good portal is a shortcut. A guide, a door into the unknown. If only they actually existed. It turns out they do. We call them X-points, or electron diffusion regions, explains plasma physicist Jack Scudder, of the University of Iowa. They're places, where the magnetic field of Earth connects to the magnetic field of the Sun, creating an uninterrupted path leading from our own planet to the sun's atmosphere 93 million miles away. A magnetic portal, from our sun to the earth? Could these magnetic energies, and portals, be accumulating in particular locations on earth, creating magnetic anomalies, and even ripples in space and time? Are these some of the same locations in which unexplained, yet possibly natural phenomenons, have been baffling humanity for thousands of years? Ancient and Sacred Landscapes Mysterious Anomalies The Missing and Vanished UFOs, and more. These subjects are just scratching the surface when it comes to the unusual phenomenon surrounding the Great Lakes. While it is understandable, many of the mysteries are unexplainable, it is possible that they are natural and just as of yet unexplained. Science, in some aspects, may be catching up with the perceived mysteries. Magnetic portals may no longer be considered science fiction, and UFOs, or UAPS, are becoming mainstream in today's day and age. Could the Great Lakes, be a focal point for these energies, and exotic technologies more so than other regions. As stated previously, to say there is any correlation is speculation, yet worthy of further investigation. This is Project Great Lakes.